Hey everybody, I know what you're thinking. Just a plain, boring bookshelf, right? Not this time. Today, I wanted to go over this bookshelf I built for my niece. She asked me to build her this so it would fit this particular spot in her wall. It was pretty much useless space until then, but I thought I would take it one step further and add these really cool LED lights that show up out of nowhere, almost like it was magic. She's a gamer and loves stuff like this, so I thought I'd really have some fun with it. This is how I built it. I hope you guys enjoy. So the key to this project were these hexagons. I was going to need a lot of them, so I decided to make them out of this 1x4 spruce that you can get for pretty inexpensive. And the best way to make a hexagon is using a miter saw set at 30 degrees. This is a great way when you got to make as many as you possibly can in a short time. I started off by cutting one hexagon. So I took this scrap piece of 1x4 and I cut the end off at 30 degrees. I measured halfway down the cut side and I cut that side at 30 degrees as well. So it looked like something like this. After that, you measure the adjoining side and cut that at 30 degrees as well. Once you've done that, you have this kind of diamond slash tree looking uh, idea. So the last step is to cut your last side. So I measured down and then cut that last side at 30 degrees. Then I had my first hexagon. It wasn't absolutely perfect, but it doesn't need to be. Because this is a piece you're going to use to set a lot of your measurements. So the first thing I did was cut one of my spruce pieces off with enough length that I could actually clamp it down. And then I took my hexagon piece and I measured the distance between that setup piece and the blade. Once I was happy with that, I locked down my setup piece as tight as I possibly could. Since you're going to be cutting so many of these, for me it was a couple hundred, I needed to make sure this wasn't going to move. Once I was sure I had it set pretty good, I got my first piece of spruce set up. Now it's important that you get your off cut piece as an opposite angle that you're going to cut. You don't want the angles parallel because that'll make for cutting your hexagons very very difficult in the next process. So if it's parallel, just flip over your off cut piece and that'll fix that. Once you're happy with your setup, you can start cutting your pieces. You should have something that looks like this little pyramid piece without a top. Once you've done that, you just flip your board over and then continue your cuts. Every once in a while, it's a good idea to check to make sure that your pieces are cut similarly. Because sometimes when you have an off-cut piece clamped down and you're pushing against it one after another, you can actually kind of slowly uh, distance that piece and then you'll lose that exact idea that you were looking for. So it's good to keep your first one handy and then kind of measure, you know, every tenth or whatever or every 20th down the road to make sure that you haven't moved that piece. Once you're happy that you haven't made any uh, serious adjustments, you can just continue on down the line making cut after cut. Like I said, this made pretty short work of this. It was, uh, it, was, it was a pretty good setup. I'll tell you right now, I didn't kind of create this way of making hexagons. Uh, I watched a bunch of different videos and I kind of took the steps I liked from each one and put it together but none of these were my ideas. 
Once you've run out of board, you can start your new one. Just cut off your tip piece there at your 30 degree angle and then continue on down the line. Again, it's probably a good idea at your new piece to check with your first piece to make sure that nothing's moved on you. So for the next part, uh, what I did was I actually set my miter saw to the other 30 degree angle because I found this a lot easier to do it this way because I'm right handed. So I clamped it down exactly the same distance as my first hexagon that I cut off, except this time I set the piece at a parallel angle with the angles that I was going to cut. And then you just have to start cutting off the tip pieces on both sides that you had. Now, I'll give you a heads up now. These little end pieces that you're cutting off, you're gonna wanna keep them. You're gonna need spacers in between your hexagons when you're laying this out. So you're gonna have a whole bunch of these. So it's a really good idea to kinda just find somewhere where you can put them so you can use them for later. But once you've done that, you can start just making your cuts one after another. Uh, be sure to go not so fast that you know you, this might become a little dangerous remember this is a uh, pretty small pieces you're working with um, so it can get a little more dangerous than cutting in a uh, full 2 by 4 or something like that but I'll show you quickly kinda how fast I had set this up and how easy this was because I think my final count of hexagons was about 253 of them so as you can see just a quick shot of kinda how I you know set up this whole setup and uh, it really did make doing all of these pretty easy but pretty safe at the same time and there you have it there's a whole bunch of hexagons. So once I'm happy with uh, how many I had, I was pretty sure that was going to be enough. It was time to make my form. I'm not really going to concentrate on how I built my form because I've done some pretty in-depth uh, videos on this. But I am going to do a very fast dance for you guys uh, to show you how good of a mood I was. Um, you know, this isn't necessary for the build. Uh, I just felt like showing you guys how I dance. I know, I'm not going to quit uh, building things. I kind of did a uh, far up shot to show you how big this form was going to be. I don't tend to make these giant forms for these 4x8 epoxy tables. Um, it's a very rare project for me, but since this was going to be a bunch of small things put together in a big one, it was something I had to do. Uh, I'm really glad I did it. Uh, I do now know that my shop is quite big enough to do something larger. But this was a whole bunch of small pieces put together, and uh, as you can tell, it was a very long and meticulous project, but it was really worth it in the end. I wasn't sure how I was going to weigh these pieces down because if I didn't put them down in some particular way, once I poured the epoxy in, they were all just going to float away. So I needed a way to lock them down and I decided to use hot glue. Uh, this worked amazing. I, my only thing I would suggest is that you don't need a lot. The slightest dab will be enough to keep whatever you're doing held down to the table long enough for your epoxy to dry because I used a bit too much on the first couple rows and it made it kind of difficult to get off. And then as I kind of figured it out down the road, I realized just a small, small dollop of hot glue was plenty to keep it where it needed to go. As you can tell, those little end cut pieces are a really good 
distance to put in between each hexagon which will give you that nice really cool looking honeycomb pattern that I had at the end there. So I kind of hammered these through one after another and then the great thing was once you had glued the last one down you were pretty much ready to take away the first bunch of spacers and move on with the next part. And as someone with severe OCD, this was so satisfying. I wasn't really sure how this was gonna look. I had a kind of couple of ideas in my head, um, but I wasn't totally sure. So before I took a full shot, I wanted to make sure I vacuumed out any little piece of dust and everything. I was gonna be using clear epoxy. Um, that was eventually going to get covered anyway, but I thought it would be best to keep it as clean as possible. And this looked so cool. I may actually try a bunch of different variations of this idea in the future because I did not realize how cool this was going to look. It was a bit of a long process to get to this point, but in my opinion, it was well worth it. Once I did that, it was time to mix up my epoxy and start my first pour. There was no way I was gonna know how much epoxy I was gonna need for this. It was gonna be impossible to calculate. So what I did was I made a bunch of small batches every once in a while and poured them in slowly because this way I was able to tell how much I was gonna need without over pouring or wasting a whole bunch. I didn't know if I was gonna need a lot between each one or it was gonna take way less than I thought. So what I did was I poured about seven liters first uh, to see where I stood with that. Seven liters is about one of those pitchers I get from the dollar store. Once I did that, I kind of spread it all around and then I did a judgment call to see how much it filled up. This was actually really nerve wracking. I had never built a form this large before and I wanted to make sure I didn't have any kind of blowout or leakage so I did try to just keep my first pour minimal and that way if I did have any kind of leakage or blowout I wouldn't have wasted all my epoxy at once. But once I uh, settled all the epoxy through and shook it all around to make sure that it would all level out I was able to see how much it filled up with that first 7 liter pour and after I took a good look it looked like it filled up about a third of the way. So I figured I was going to need about 23 liters of epoxy. So after about a day, I let that sit to make sure that it didn't have any leaks. And once I was happy with that, I came back and made sure that everything was still level and nothing shifted or adjusted on me. Once I was happy, nothing moved, I decided to move on with the next pour. I did this in three pours instead of just filling it right up to the top right off the bat. Um, unlike a river table, the epoxy doesn't kind of spread down the middle. You have to really work it through all the nooks and crannies of all the different hexagons because it, it really took a while and sometimes since this table was fully level a lot of it just kind of stayed on top and I needed the epoxy to be in the honeycomb pattern of all the hexagons so I took a, a good while to make sure that I did spread it all into the middle and all into the pattern before I would go on with the next pour. After a couple days I came back and I checked it to make sure that I didn't have any kind of massive cracks or leaks or anything like that. I had a few bubbles here and there. Um, because this is spruce and it's not the greatest wood that it uh, you're gonna get bubbles with this but it was gonna cover it with a film that you'll see in the next bit so it wasn't a huge deal. You just have to make sure you don't have any massive cracks or leaks. But after I was happy with the pour I came back and I did need to level it all out because a little bit of the honeycomb pattern was able to be felt on top so I needed to clear off the top level so it was all flat to the touch. Once I'd flattened it out 
uh, was time to demold this and I was really nervous about this because I wasn't sure if being a pretty big piece of epoxy with essentially some hexagons in the middle I thought that maybe while I was trying to pull the hot glue off the bottom I was gonna maybe crack it in half or even into a couple of pieces in which case I wasn't sure if that was gonna even be repairable or not so I had to make sure I took this very slowly however when I started demolding it it felt like this was more like demolding something that was rubber it was extremely malleable and very bendable so I was actually able to use a chisel to get in there because I wasn't gonna chip it or anything um, it was just completely bending and the biggest problem was just getting that one side of hot glue where I used too much to get it off but because it was so bendable it made unmolding this so easy I mean physically it wasn't great but I was uh, I was really happy with the fact that I could demold it without the worry of cracking it I mean look at my face so once I did that I decided to cut it down to its almost final measurements I wanted to give myself a little bit of playroom to have uh, just in case I did decide to flatten the other side as you can tell the uh, the glue spots were pretty prevalent there so I just gave it a quick round out with my router and my sled and uh, you know a whole snowstorm of dust in there ensued but it really came out a lot better getting that all off in the end. Um, a lot of people hate sanding. I actually kind of find it relaxing. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I, uh, I have my music in there. I've got two dust collection systems in my shop as well. So I don't really need to wear a mask. It's never really an issue when I'm sanding. Uh, between my vacuum, my you know HVAC system, and my actual extra little vent that I installed, it really does help keep all the dust at bay. It doesn't bring it down to zero, but it does help quite a bit. This first process of sanding was pretty difficult. Um, my router bit was pretty old and pretty beat down, so it left quite a few burn marks throughout the entire process. So it took a couple of 40 grit sandpapers to get it down to where I need it. But once I did that, it, uh, it was a lot easier. I'm not really gonna show you the different processes of sanding because after this one, it didn't really show up very uh, differently after each process. However, I will tell you that after I sand something with epoxy in it, I do tend to clean it off with a little isopropylene rubbing alcohol. It's great for when you're doing something like this. It cleans off a lot of the dust, but it doesn't really change the texture of the wood you're working with. It doesn't water pop it. So it's a really, really good way to get as much dust off of your project without having to re-sand it after that. Next, I wanted to make sure that I actually sealed the hexagons. I mean, I was using a pretty inexpensive uh, kind of spruce material so I thought it'd be a good idea to seal it so the individual hexagons wouldn't maybe crack over time I didn't think they would but I had a lot of this uh, pretty inexpensive uh, sealant lying around I thought I'd give it a try and also this gave me an opportunity to try buffing in a sealer I've seen it done a bunch of times I've never really given it a try and uh, I had this buffer lying around for the longest time, so I thought I'd give it a try, and I'm actually really glad I did. Whoever kind of came up with this idea, I gotta pat you on the bat. This worked really well. Because buffing in something this size with your hand is just insane. I was a little worried that I might kind of scratch it up a bit more and then have to re-sand it, but no, I mean, this is a, this is a really good way of doing this. A lot of people don't really have these huge buffers lying around. I picked it up on sale somewhere. However, they do have buffing attachments for your regular orbital sander. So if you are looking to try something like this, you can just get an, an attachment for your hand sander. And uh, I think that'll work out really well. Um, 
I had to buff out the other side as well, but there's still a lot of dust on that main piece of board that I'm using. So I use these automotive wipes uh, to clean off any like dust that's left. And I love using these for this project. You'll see that it really does clean off the dust and it keeps it in the cloth. It doesn't really come off after you use this. I was, uh, wasn't very sparse using this sealer. I didn't really mind. Again, it was kind of this extra one that I had lying around. So, and I was really just kind of trying to seal up this, you know, inexpensive spruce. So I was absolutely ecstatic with how it looked after. It was almost a shame to have to cover it up once I did this, but I really wanted the effect of the LED lighting to show up out of nowhere. I thought that was going to be the coolest part to this project. So I had to cover it up, but again, I think I'm going to try something in the future with this idea because this worked out so cool. I got this backer board um, for the back because when I install the LEDs, I don't want the back to shine out so much. So I had to cut this in the same time that I cut the rest of this board because it did have to fit a very specific spot in my niece's bedroom. So luckily it was a very simple 45 degree cut um, because her bedroom is up in a renovated attic. Uh, it's really cool looking bedroom. I got to give it to my brother-in-law for doing that. But this one spot was kind of hard to fill. So she needed this to cut in a very specific way. And since everything else was done, it was time to cover it with this white film. This was so unbelievably difficult to use. I don't know if it's meant to be used on something so large or if it's just meant to be used on a board or maybe on a wall, not something sitting flat, but it was very, very difficult to put on. I'll tell you right now, whatever camera angle you're watching this in, I didn't really do an amazing job of kind of covering this up. But luckily, after the shelves and everything were installed, it was very, very unnoticeable, even when you're looking at it pretty close on. I did toy with the idea of painting this instead. Unfortunately, when you're painting something, it's really hard to get good coverage and to completely cover up what you're trying to do with just one coat. And I was afraid if I did paint it, I was going to cover it up to the point where very little of the LED was actually going to shine through. So I figured that this was going to be my best bet to do this. So I really just kind of took my time and worked with it as much as I could. If you have any kind of tips or tricks on how to install this stuff, I would love to hear it in the uh, comments because man, I was screaming my head off when I was doing this. If you guys do like these kind of videos, um, please feel free to subscribe and I, I love comments. I mean, I've had so many amazingly positive comments um, and very, very few critical ones. And even those critical ones were done in actually kind of a positive tone. It was, it's really nice to see. I'm loving doing this channel. Uh, you guys have all been amazing. So if you haven't subscribed just yet, please feel free to subscribe and make any comments you like, any suggestions on anything you'd like to see me build in the future. The next up after putting the film on was I needed to put a border around the back so that when I installed the LEDs, I would have lots of room to work with and nothing would ever bang against them or squash them or anything like that because the LED was a pretty expensive but somewhat fragile idea. I used these electrical clips that you just hammer in with a regular hammer. I wasn't sure how to install these. They came with clips, uh, but it wasn't going to work for this project, so I had to try something different. And these were amazing. Uh, they gave me all the hold I needed but it didn't damage it, it didn't scratch the LED. It was, it was a really great, great way to hold this in place. Uh, I do need to make sure that this film idea was gonna work. I didn't have any way to test this prior, so I decided to give it a try now that everything's all done and installed, and I was pretty nervous because I'd spent all this work on this up until now, so here we go and you can't tell because the lights are off but man 
I was jumping up and down when I saw how clear the LEDs came through the the film. It was it was unreal. I was so happy I went with this idea instead of painting over it because this was amazing. Once the back is completely covered up, you can't tell there's anything there. It's completely white. So now that I was really happy with the result, uh, very little was left to do. I just kind of got these 12 inch melamine boards. Um, I needed something that looked very similar to the film that I installed. It kind of still had to look uniform. So I got these melamine boards, uh, which was great because they were kind of already cut down to size. I just had to cut them lengthwise. I'm not really going to delve into too much depth about this 45 degree angle because all I had to do was measure the distance and then cut the board at 45 degrees. It, it was very easy actually. But I wasn't in love with the position of the LEDs. I hadn't realized that this particular strip, the main LED comes from the center and it goes out to the rest of it. So I thought I would take this opportunity while I stood it up to kind of readjust it into a more interesting pattern. So I decided to put the middle of the LED in the middle of the bookshelf and kind of wire around the rest like this kind of figure eight pattern. And uh, I feel like that was a way better look in the end. I'm really happy I decided to change it because this was a lot cooler than just the circle look. And this little effect here really came out very interesting. Uh, these LEDs actually have a bunch of different patterns that you can pick from and I think you can download an app uh, that lets you adjust it and make personal touches to it too. Next up, I really just kind of cut down one inch strips of MDF and um, kind of just trimmed the entire outside of this thing. Every corner I found, I trimmed it up and then filled in all the holes with uh, wood filler. Nothing specific. It's one of the reasons why I love working with MDF. It's so easy to manage and so easy to work with. And in the end, it's so easy to make it look nice and clean and simple. So if you're ever wondering, you know, how to trim up any kind of project, you're not quite sure how to do it if you don't want to spend too much, uh, MDF is a really nice way to do this. After that, I just kind of threw on these 45 degree looking holders around to kind of give the whole shelf a bit of a uniform look to it, just so that not one little tiny piece was 45 degrees. Once I did that, I kind of pulled out my sprayer sprayed it up. I brushed on the original coat of um, primer because MDF just soaks. It's like a sponge. It soaks up whatever uh, paint you're using. So always use a bit of a cheap primer for MDF. Um, it'll really kind of make your next process a lot cleaner. After that, I took the backer board that I cut down the size with the original board and just kind of threw it on the back. This is pretty easy but it was a little nerve wracking because I wasn't sure if I had actually damaged the LEDs. So it was gonna take a lot of work to take everything apart. <laughs> but I uh, decided to try it all together now that the shelves were in and see what it would look like while the shelves were all in. And this was awesome. I was so happy. My niece was super ecstatic when she saw it too. She couldn't believe her eyes. She loved it. Um, her parents, thought it was really cool her sisters thought it was really cool I'm super happy with how this came out I wasn't sure even kind of how it was gonna come out when I first started this but the way that the LEDs show up out of nowhere right now it just looks plain white and then turning it on is such a cool look so I'm so happy it fit in her room perfectly so she was really happy about that and it just makes her whole room look really interesting I wanted to thank you guys for watching today. This was uh, a little different than what I normally do, but I'm really happy I did it. So if you guys did like this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Feel free to add any comments. I try to respond to as many of them as I can. I haven't not been able to respond just yet. So once again from all of us here at New Classic Designs, thanks for stopping by and I hope I see you again.